So it's time for us to move on to our first uh, panel session, although there is a very important thing you need to do, which is to vote in our public awards, and you can do so by going online to innovate.eu. You can use the application. Uh, we, you can download it onto your smartphones. You can also vote on the tablets when we go for a coffee break. And please make sure you vote, because we're going to be giving out that prize at the end of today, and it, uh, it's great for everybody to be able to have their say. So I'm going to uh, now invite up on stage uh, for the panel session, uh, talking about the two pillars of the EIT in the future, education and the regional dimension. I'll, I'd like to invite up on stage Anna Turbovic, Vivian Hoffman, Sanya Damjanovic, Mary Therese Thiel, and Emma Nerenrein. Please come on up. <laughs> so I'm going to sit down over here. You just take all of those spaces over there. And I'm going to introduce everybody properly. So on my left here, Mary Therese Thiel, Senior Executive and CEO of uh, InnoG Hungary. Uh, been working with RWE since 1990, I believe. A key role in uh, the Energy Innovation Hub as well. Next to you, Anna Turbovic, a member of the governing board of the EIT, co-founder and chief operating officer of Grid Singularity, which is a green blockchain venture and involved in economic reforms and the EU accession process in Serbia. Uh, to your left, uh, Minister Damjanovic, um, Minister of Science in Montenegro. Uh, physicist by profession, used to work at CERN and also the facility for anti-proton and iron research in Darmstadt. Welcome, great to have you here. Um, uh, sitting next to you, we have uh, Vivian Hoffman, Deputy Director General for the European Commission's Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. And then to your left, uh, Emma Nerenreim, Chief Environmental Officer at Northvolt, the company that says it wants to build the greenest battery in the world and uh, with the minimal carbon footprint. Uh, she has a PhD in water and waste recycling in the metal industry. Thank you very much for being here. We're talking about how we take forward education, regional dimension. I'd like to talk to the minister first, really, try and get your thoughts um, on how, how you think the EIT is doing at the moment, uh, how things could develop in the future, um, in reference, obviously, to some of the decisions that have been made recently by the European Commission, and also that we're talking about the, the budget going up a, as well, um, and based on your experiences, because you're making decisions on research and innovation in Montenegro, you used to work at CERN as well. Uh, what do you think are the barriers at the moment to innovation in Europe? What can we do to, to break them down? Sure, you. And you need to pick up a microphone, uh, just to your left there. And these are directional microphones, so you kind of need to point them straight towards you. That you it's on, it's fine. Is it it's on? Fine. Yes. It should be. Uh, first, uh, let me say it's a really great pleasure for me to participate in... Is, is it Yeah, fine? and you just need to have it like that. So there it's a great go. pleasure for me to participate in this uh, uh, nice event. And thank you very much for your introduction, pointing that I'm a scientist uh, by profession uh, who spent the largest part of my career at CERN. So before I give you a answer, a direct answer to your question, uh, please uh, let me make the following statement. I think Europe should be really proud to have world center of excellence like CERN. 13,000 users, 120 nations, 3,000 PhDs. Now, although the main track of CERN is fundamental research, but innovations are spinning out, out of research uh, into business continuously from the very beginning of uh, CEN. Many breakthroughs uh, happen out of CEN, just to mention the most famous one, uh, World Wide Web. So I really believe that uh, this uh, CEN knowledge triangle model very much corresponds to knowledge uh, triangle model developed by EIT, and I um, truly believe that this is the right, uh, the right way. So I want also to make another statement. It is really amazing what CERN offers to young people. They really uh, give a chance to young people to be leaders. So if you really uh, um, put high challenges for young people, uh, then uh, young people are pulling of themselves strength to become, uh, to become uh, great, uh, great uh, leaders. And not to say about uh, just that they are 
uh, now out of 10, um, uh, spreading uh, so-called big business incubators and mostly thanks to young people. Now coming to your question about what are the barriers in, in doing innovation, they are as usual, our way of working, of thinking, of, uh, of uh, bureaucracy. So universities and academic set, uh, uh, settings, they should be really more friendly to uh, um, uh, going out of this, um, uh, let's say, uh, traditional way of, um, of, uh, of uh, thinking. Uh, now, um, also, uh, we should really offer young people better chance, like example of uh, ten shows. Now, these uh, larger challenges are legislations, uh, our slow speed uh, to, um, to react to the current challenges or to in innovation or, um, opportunities. But I would like to say that EU is really showing us now the way how to be creative in bureaucracy and I'm very much encouraged by nowadays is, um, uh, is offered to innovation and primarily through the EIT but also EIC, European Innovation uh, Council. Yeah. Interesting. I'm going to pass on because there are lots of interesting points you had to say about the role of the Commission there. Um, uh, Vivian Hoffman, what, what do you think are the big assets of the EIT when it comes to, to education and what's your reaction to what you just heard as well? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, education lies very much at the core of the EIT model. And when we look at the knowledge triangle, I think one could say that education should be the basis of the triangle all the sides of the triangle need to be strong and each of them strengthens the other. But we think that education is really the basis because what is innovation about? It is about people. It is made by people for people and therefore it is about talents. And it's clear that without education there would be no excellent research. There would be no innovations. There would be no entrepreneurs. And the EITs bring, the EIT brings all these actors together, education, business, research. And the EIT already has a track record when it comes to, to education, uh, the master programs, uh, the doctoral programs. So uh, it has introduced new formats in education as well. Uh, it connects business and uh, universities uh, it proposes internships to, to scholars and it also offers courses for professionals, which is very important. And therefore, I think we can talk about a T-shape when it comes to talents, comprehensive talents, which add to the very specialized, strong competences in the respective disciplines a new set of skills that are absolutely indispensable if we want innovation to, to happen. And of course we are talking about forward-looking new skills. And one of them is, for instance, creativity, because often creativity is the first step towards innovation. We are talking about resilience, we, have, uh, we talk about critical mindsets, we talk about entrepreneurship, uh, which entails that uh, young people must be encouraged to think that it's okay to take risks and many more other skills. And why are these so important? Because they will accompany a person throughout their life and the person will have to update a whole series of skills as we go along because unfortunately or fortunately uh, skills become outdated much more uh, fast and, and so reskilling and lifelong learning is also something that the EIT does. Now, um, I, I uh, also met the alumni and by the way I felt very much encouraged with, by what they had to tell us about the EIT uh, education offer. Uh, on your question, uh, what is the next step? I think that the next step uh, should be a way of making the EIT action on education even more systemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, thinking in a, in a long-term perspective, um, we uh, have proposed, the European ha Commission has proposed uh, under the lead of Commissioner Navracic, this new action for the EIT to help higher education institutions to develop their innovation capacity. And uh, in summary, that means 
that the EIT and knowledge innovation communities, which are the real actors on the ground, should extend their education offer and their relationship with many more higher education institutions beyond the KICS partner. So that, that's a new approach and uh, we very much believe in it. And uh, secondly, we also uh, think that with regard to education, the EIT must maintain a, a very strong regional dimension. And this is why uh, we have also proposed uh, in this new proposal for the IT uh, to make sure that uh, the share uh, of this action uh, that goes to regions which are not yet so strong in terms of innovation is a, substantive, a substantial one. So at least a quarter. And, uh, and then finally, uh, again, uh, we emphasize the, the very um, great importance of lifelong learning and how this new action should be designed also in a life learning, long, lifelong learning perspective. Lots of interesting things to talk about there as well. And um, a reminder that, of course, we'll be going for questions um, uh, after we've, we've had a chat to some of the panellists here. So I'm sure that some of those things you'll be wanting to pick up on. Um, Anna, I'm going to turn to you. Um, what are the big challenges bridging the kind of business world and the academic world? They don't necessarily, necessarily naturally come together. What do you do to make that an easier thing? Yes, um, thank you for that question. It's a challenge because for me it comes very easy and logical. You know, I come from an academic uh, world and I'm now a part of a startup. And um, that collaboration to me is natural, but I have discovered that it is not to many other people. Uh, because when you look at it from a business perspective, businesses tend to think that this is not a good uh, time spent because it takes a very long time to come to any results and we have to move more quickly. Uh, these are uh, longer term projects, several years sound uh, like a very long time when, when you are a startup and trying to, to, to move fast, uh, especially when you are you know, in cutting edge uh, fields. Uh, however, over time they come to realize the benefits. So uh, in the break, I got a call from one of the universities that we were working with uh, to propose several ideas for master thesis for their students who may be interested in this field and who want to collaborate with a startup in this field. And uh, their research results will benefit them because they will become skilled and, and educated in this area. And it will benefit us because we will come to, to more findings that may be interesting to our work. Uh, so this is the type of collaboration. And uh, when we as EIT governing board uh, look at the impact of different uh, communities and what they have done in the education sphere, we have this very interesting discussion that there are measurable uh, performance uh, indicators or KPIs, um, such as the number of graduates, uh, the types of programs created. But there are also uh, sometimes more important uh, effects of EIT in that they have mainstreamed some topics and that uh, universities that have started working with EIT some years ago are now developing programs that are similar to some that they have developed with through EIT uh, that try to integrate business perspective and, and, and um, to have students have that practical experience as they study. So that is a more, even perhaps a more important impact that we have created at, as EIT and that we would like to continue. So the, the commission now has this uh, wonderful goal to try to extend the number of partnerships so that we come to several hundred uh, higher education institutions that have a similar approach. And the issue there, and now I'm coming from a less developed par part uh, of Europe, so I'm, I'm originally from Serbia, uh, we have a number of universities that are publicly financed that have no incentive to match the need of the market because it doesn't affect how they're financed. Now, in most of the rest of Europe, this has changed and competitive financing is an important source of financing. And, and this is the type of education reform that has to go hand in hand with other types of business climate reform so that we can harness the potential of education and research, which is very high in Europe. And um, uh, one of my favorite economists uh, at the moment is Mariana Mazzucato, which, you know, a person who has proven 
uh, a very simple truth to us, which is that the, the, the major, the leading global innovators today uh, have had tremendous help from public research results and public funding. And therefore, uh, this is something that we need to look at as Europe and not run away from uh, in this uh, neoliberalist approach, but go back uh, to some of the more smart interventions while letting, of course, business uh, make the choices and lead the way. Mary Therese, I was going to ask you a question. You have a microphone down here, that's good. Uh, we have obviously got a, an all-female panel here, um, and you're in a very powerful position here in, in Hungary in your, in your, in your company. Um, what do you think about ways to bring women into leadership positions? How do you kind of foster that in the education world as, as well? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, first of all, I'm Marie, and uh, my company is responsible that the lights are on here <laughs> in Budapest. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, the the energy industry you might have heard is in a very disruptive phase. So uh, we have to deal with innovation and digitalization, and beside my job as the head of this company uh, where I'm located in Budapest since 15 years. So I feel as local. And uh, beside that, I'm the vice president of the Chamber of Commerce, the Hungarian-German Chamber of Commerce. And in this respect, I feel the duty to connect the innovation community, I would say, with the, with the economy. So uh, therefore, I'm so thankful that you invited me here to this panel. And as this uh, Chamber of Commerce, we have founded a so-called Network Digital, and we have uh, associated supporters, uh, for example, this uh, Hungarian uh, Ministry of Innovation and Technology is one of our supporters, so I invite LTI uh, as a supporter. Maybe we can continue the discussion on that. And this network uh, has brought together the um, Austrian and Swiss Chamber of Commerce, so the German-speaking, I would say, association, associations and the business council of these countries. And uh, with that, we have the majority of the business here in, in, in Budapest. And Budapest, I would say, is the heart of CEE. And beside my responsibility um, uh, for these operational companies here, I'm responsible for Inuji, for the networks in CEE. So I can have a quite good comparison for the Polish, the Slovakian and the Czech and the Hungarian communities. And I would say uh, I see digitalization and innovation as a game changer for CEE. And therefore, uh, it, 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 will, it will create the future of made in CE. And that is the bridge to the, to the economic uh, uh, companies. And my experience was when I was also in part time responsible for some innovation lighthouses, that it is difficult to connect the operative business with some horizon two or three uh, innovation activities. So we have to manage uh, the bridge between the uh, innovators and the management of the companies. And we have not only to convince the head of the companies, even if they are fossils like me, yeah, uh, we have also to convince the middle management. And that needs an integration of these innovation activities and the universities, uh, th those one who work on uh, innovation. Because I'm absolutely convinced that CE has the great chances uh, to make quicker progress uh, than the Western European uh, countries in that, and to overjump certain um, stages of development uh, because the people here are used to create something with less money, uh, with, with they, they have always to survive and that makes them very strong and that makes them also very open for change. 
So I can only say on this field I would like to work and this is a great chance for CEE uh, and maybe later I can say concrete topics what we are doing uh, to, to connect this innovation community with the uh, economy. Thank you for that. I'm going to uh, go over to Emma. I'm wondering if you have got a microphone over there, do you? Okay. You have now. Marvellous. <laughs> um, the uh, European Commission says it wants to create a circular economy. Sounds like your company might be trying to go in that direction too. What has been the role of the EIT for, for your organisation? Talk to us a little bit about that and how, how you think it should develop in the future. I can talk about EIT, yes, and also about circular economy. I want to do yeah. that because I prepare that. Go on. It's a really interesting topic. So, uh, no, we had Inno Energy on board very early in our company. We are very grateful for that. They played a very important role uh, being a, a business financing partner rather than a, only a financing partner, which was extremely important. Uh, you have to remember that at the time we had an excellent idea. We had great plans. We had the best CVs probably to do this. Uh, but it was also very early in our company's history that Inno Energy and EIT came on board. Also being flexible enough in how to support, extremely important. Uh, and going along, uh, we also had some very um, disruptive and innovative uh, business models, uh, which include circular economy, so bringing recycling uh, of the batteries at the end of life into the entire business model was also something where we needed to challenge the entire sort of financing system, also to think a little bit ahead, so being very early, um, but, but primarily to also have uh, an understanding of what would this have uh, for implications in, in EU in general, for the business landscape, for our competitiveness, for our, um, how di we differentiate ourselves as a, uh, as a continent. And I think that just to point out the two major uh, ways that we will differentiate the European Union in terms of battery production. So, I, you sure, I'm sure you already know this, but, but uh, batteries are made of metals and elements. That they are elements, meaning that they can actually be recycled by definition. This is uh, the, the main difference between fossil fuels that by definition are put from the ground, being combusted and then being let into the atmosphere. This means that if we do this right from the beginning and not being first on the global market may be a, 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 a sort of a, a good thing in this case, uh, we can actually make sure, first of all, that we become self-sustainable within Europe for our own production usage uh, of, of EVs, of batteries, uh, which is extremely important given that the European Union and, and we do not control the global market of metals that we need for the battery production right now. Second of all, uh, we will differentiate. So for, for anyone who still wants to buy one of the nice European fancy cars, uh, you can also make that choice from a responsibility perspective, which I'm sure we'll, we can leverage on quite a lot from a, from a sort of overall EU business model perspective. Interesting. Lots of interesting things to talk about. Um, I would like to say that in theory, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so and somebody will come forward with a microphone and usual format, tell us your name, tell us where you come from and, and give us your question. And so um, the people who will, who will have the microphones will be around. If anybody wants to ask a question, please, you can start now already and raise your hands. Um, I'm interested in the regional dimension, the, the, this, this regional innovation scheme that, that we have here, uh, here at the EIT. How effective has it been? And, and uh, Minster, I'm interested in he hearing your thoughts on that. And how do you make it work better? How do you bring together this, these, these regions? Is that the right approach, etc.? Okay, thanks also for raising this question. So I, can, I see um, EIT as a really strong motor of innovation in Europe, and this is becoming visible wherever their communities uh, exist. I need to point out that some of our scientists, also representative from business sector or startup, participated in EIT events, schools, and competition. And we are now building one project of business academia in the field of raw materials, and I see immediately complete uh, 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 strong impact on, on their way
way of thinking also or working. So what I can say, I really strongly support establishment of KICS or EIT hubs in the region uh, which are lagging behind like uh, Western Balkans. So more so that Western Balkan countries developed or are being developing smart specialization uh, strategy and uh, what also what the Commissioner mentioned. I just want also to point this smart specialization strategy is a really great recipe of European Commission through uh, JRC because it gives us now possibility to focus our efforts on our challenge, uh, uh, now common challenges and our uh, potential. So what we did recently, we apply uh, for IPA multi-country um, support to establish uh, EI, EIT hubs in our region and I really hope for support from the DG near in this direction and I'm really looking forward uh, to see um, building much stronger outreach of EIT in our region. Uh, you know, coming from now such small countries of Western Balkan, uh, you always feel something like, you know, lagging behind or third part of uh, Europe or something like that. But I just want to remind you that our region in the past had incredible development uh, a period of, of technological development. In our region, for example, three international institutes exist which are old, older than CERN. One of them in Serbia, Vinci, which celebrated last year 70 university. Um, and I want just to point one thing, that in our region, the first research nuclear reactor started to operate only two years later than research nuclear reactor started to operate in Germany. We were also one of the founders of CERN. So I'm really looking forward and I really hope that you, in your strategy, in the next strategy, will also dedicate dedicate some budget to establish these EIT hubs and help in helping us to really uh, uh, bring back uh, tradition in technology which we had. And not to tell you that we have uh, one of the large, I think everybody say they have problems in uh, brain drain, but I think this region, which is large part of Europe, uh, has really big, big economic loss, and this is our brain drain. So I'm really looking forward to see EIT hubs in our region, and please, I uh, help and us I'd like that. to pick up on something Anna said, said about actually about this, this, the fact that in your country, uh, in the country of origin, that the universities were financed and didn't need to go and look for funding. Was th that was the case, that's what you were saying. And so they, in fact, they didn't feel any need to be comp competitive or innovative. Uh, that is unfortunately still the case for, for many public how universities. How do you fix that? How do you uh, fix that? And is that the case in Montenegro as well? Uh, well, th you always have leaders, right? So we have, we even have people from the region who have won ERC grants or who have participated in different EIT competitions. And I think the idea fr from, from the governing board perspective is that we would like to see this so-called risk activity, right, go from a marginal activity to a mainstream activity. So that, uh, and this is the case in fact with the new knowledge uh, and innovation communities being established that already have hubs in the region because they're interesting uh, to the field that they're, they're looking at and, and not just because they were quote unquote marginal. So, so there is a gap that is to be recognized, but it is untapped potential. So uh, the EIT connects uh, and taps into this potential. And, and as I noted earlier, this is the case with tapping into uh, geographic uh, diversity. It's also tapping into women entrepreneurship potential. It's also encouraging youth uh, entrepreneurship. If you read some of the interviews of the past winners of the, the EIT uh, awards, uh, they will often say something like, before I took this class, I didn't consider myself to potentially ever be an entrepreneur. So we need them to feel encouraged that it is possible and, and that it's not always going to be a breakthrough innovation, but it may be a small innovation that will be bring us closer to an improved product or service and improve our livelihood. And, and, and all of this together uh, is, is innovation. So as, as a continent, culturally, we need to bring ourselves to be more um, prone to taking risks and, and taking this entrepreneurial mindset. Mm. And this is where I feel this type of community contributes. Now, of course, in this room, we are preaching to the converted, but outside of this room, we're all making ripples across Europe and trying to connect this untapped potential. Thinking of making ripples, we've got some questions fr from the audience. Would you like to 
Tell us your name, tell us your job, and ask us your question. Hi, I'm Shea Van Dijk. Um, I'm the founder of the Digital Leadership Institute, and I would like to thank you for that perfect introduction to my question, which was um, not just uh, preaching to the converted, but a, a few statistics I want to throw at you. First, um, the incredible demand for IT professionals in Europe and the link with um, IT as um, you know, a critical uh, factor in innovation, um, but that the participation of women in those numbers is flatlining. So we have not even as many women IT professionals in Europe today as we did almost 15 years ago. I think is an alarming statistic. Um, look at Eurostat if you don't believe me. Uh, the other thing is about uh, women in tech startups specifically. So I bet you can all tell me how many women are among the award candidates as well as in your kicks. And um, this is a critical challenge, I think, to have diversity in leadership in the digital society. What's your question? Um, what are you and we all going to do about this? Concretely. So here I come with my concrete examples. So last week we have uh, initiated three roadshows for tech girls here in Budapest. Uh, together with my colleagues from the chamber, I think 10, ten uh, companies have uh, had uh, uh, events in Budapest, in Mischkolz and in Pech. Um, this was supported by Mr. Palkovich and we had as guest on honor Judith Varga, the Minister of Justice, who empowered the ladies that uh, for female in CE everything is possible. And you have to start in the beginning, that's first, yeah, to, to motivate these colleagues from, uh, from from uh, schools, we had round about 1,000 participants in the three uh, cities to motivate them and to attract them, yeah, that if they join, for example, an electricity company, they don't have to climb up on, on electricity poles, yeah, there are other jobs, there are exactly these IT jobs, there are these uh, digital jobs. That's so you mean first. literally explaining the yes, practicalities of here's them. what the job yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. Then in the universities you have to find uh, uh, or you have to support uh, not only the uh, IT or technique specific but the leadership. The leadership because it's, I think uh, innovation is also a high part a leadership topic. Uh, and, and I would support and we gave a um, uh, uh, stipendium. Yeah? We gave uh, uh, Satras together with the Andras uni University here in Budapest. Uh, we have female leadership, leadership and innovation, leadership and digitalization, yeah, such kind, so that they grow up and have the understanding for that, that they can bring that into the companies. As what I kind said, of age when you say starting out in school? You're talking about schools here, right? Schools, uh, starting in the schools, continue at the university, yeah, and later in the companies you have to have female networks. I, I mean, if we want to increase the female participation in that, I'm focusing on that now, yeah? Mm. You have to have female networks who support each other in uh, doing that. And then automatically, automatically the male colleagues will join that because of course we won't would like to create a pure female word. That would be stupid, yeah? Go on, Anna. Yeah. Um, so I, I can tell you what EIT tries to do uh, for, from the, the, the comprehensive perspective. And before I say that, I'd like to say that there are two reasons why we do that. One is, is, is equality per se, and, and that being one of the values uh, in Europe. Um, the second is that all the studies show that uh, productivity of a company is enhanced with diversity. So there is an economic impact as well. Uh, now, uh, again, researchers have, that have looked into this issue um, uh, see as main uh, challenges those that were just uh, elaborated on, which is, um, uh, not sufficient number of role models, uh, weak networks compared to men that have 
propagated themselves to the top jobs generations ahead and therefore have an advantage that is a natural one or a current one, uh, if you wish, not so natural, but current. And, and uh, the, there is an issue with financing as well. Uh, with the most acute issue being also if you look at the employment, the, the top management positions. So uh, one of the things that we did is to foster, um, to, to encourage women to apply for the GB board. Uh, and to, to see that it's uh, possible, what actually happened is that now we have uh, a reverse uh, lack of parity, which is that 9 out of 12 members of the board currently are women. Ideally, we would like to have six and six, so that, that's what we're st striving to get. But encouraging good candidates to apply, this is, this is what ended up being the result, meaning that it is possible to reach out, it is very possible to have parity on all the boards. We have encouraged our knowledge innovation communities to do the same and, and have some positive measures to, 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 to track that and follow that. So tracking, monitoring is another important measure because to, to go anywhere, we need to see where we are now. So we are tracking, you know, how many students we have of each gender, also from different geography. And um, uh, so, so those are some of the steps that we took. Uh, we are also looking at how many are being trained uh, at, at the business level, how many get financing. Uh, and some uh, communities also have some specific programs to, to improve role models and, and to improve networks um, and so forth. So, so it is being done. Uh, whether it is sufficient, probably not. We should probably do even more. Uh, but the important thing is that there is more awareness that this should be done. And there are less and less people saying that this is not possible to do. I come from energy and IT, trust me, the overlap of those two is probably the most challenging. It is possible. Uh, we have a very diverse uh, employee uh, structure at, at my firm, at firms that I work at, and it, it, it brings us a higher level of productivity. I can see it in my own work. Uh, I have recently met uh, the, the woman who is head of human resources at Unilever. You know that's a very large logistics company employing a lot of technical engineers uh, where you would say in theory there is a challenge. Uh, she told her middle managers go back because if you look at the, the figures of, of different universities, we should be able to find sufficient number of employees. Currently Unilever is at 50-50 at board level and 40% uh, women now in all of the workforce and, and, and striving to get parity. So a large company like, like that showed as well that, that it could be possible. But it is a challenge in digital, as you noted, not just for women, but men as well. So we are seeing um, that uh, these are the skills that are required more and more, and not just in computer programming, but energy, biology, you name it. Uh, 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 people now have to have enhanced uh, digital skills and we all have to read every day, as, 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 uh, as uh, Ms. Hoffman said, the lifelong learning is another arm. So although EIT has a focus on higher education and this uh, DG especially and, and, and Commissioner Navracic has done a lot to, to foster uh, the role of higher education in innovation, uh, we are also more and more involved with this lifelong learning and, and, and uh, especially for professionals, um, such as medical professionals, for example, which, which is seen as a need in that field uh, in particular. But I'll, I think I'll we have stay a question uh, here. Just wait for the microphone to come along to you. Hang on. The next to the chap in the white shirt. I can't see you very well. France. Um, Mrs. Steele mentioned for the first time schools. My question is for Mrs. Hoffman because you mentioned lifelong learning but never, um, never something about the connection which is for me uh, <coughs> crucial between higher education industry and secondary education. What is the plan? Can you just um, repeat your name and your job? We didn't quite catch it. Nelly Gay from France, Alert Education Consultant. Former school head in three countries in Europe. <laughs> Thank you very 
Thank you very much for, for your question. Of course, uh, I, I focused on, on some uh, specific aspects, but nevertheless, uh, of course, we, we have a full comprehensive strategy for education uh, and, and we look at all the aspects of education and that even starts with uh, early childhood care and education, going to school education, going to higher education, going to lifelong learning and uh, of course uh, cooperation between schools and uh, projects, exchange of best practices that will then eventually lead also to uh, the skills that are so important for uh, later on for uh, creating entrepreneurial mindsets. All this is already present uh, in our education agenda. And indeed, I think it's very important what you say, uh, that uh, the cooperation between uh, business and schools starts from a very early uh, stage on. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, I think cooperation projects, best practices, and everything uh, that can be supported uh, to actually make sure that we have a very broad and comprehensive cooperation between business and education at all stages, I think that's most welcome indeed. We have uh, another question, gentleman down here. Um, thank you. My name is Bernd Fiesel. I am director of the European Creative Business Network in Rotterdam. Uh, my question is a little bit challenging. I mean, innovation is always about uh, challenge the, challenging the things you know, so please forgive me uh, for asking, is this the right question you are debating today? We know that um, education and regional development is important, but to take the EIT forward the next 10 years, what about the global talent? We know that most of the talent in AI or in batteries and a lot of tech is in China, is outside of Europe. So how do you combine uh, the regional education and the global education? What kinds of forms do we have to bring international talent here to be really best on an international scale, not only on a regional scale? Interesting question. Who fancies to go at that one? Go on. I'm going to answer just super short. The two last girls I recruited directly from the Inno Energy Master Program was from China and Jamaica. Um, I'm currently based in uh, Berlin, Germany. Uh, we were supposed to be based in Switzerland. Uh, one of the reasons, the key reason why the team in Berlin grew was the friendly immigration policy. And uh, again, also just recruited a Kenyan engineer, a woman uh, who, is, who is an excellent uh, uh, asset to our firm. Um, and I would like to ask, I mean, I don't know if any alumni are present here, uh, but I have met several yesterday uh, that are not European and that are participating in our programs. Um, and I would also like to let you know, you may not be aware of this, but we are opening an office in China. We just opened one in Palo Alto, San Francisco, uh, both to connect with talent, um, but also to connect with investment and untapped potential in other regions, because most definitely the companies that were supporting know no boundaries, and they're global and not just European, including uh, the one that is here. So, so yes, we're definitely not thinking narrow. Uh, we are much more ambitious than, than Europe, yes. Anybody else got anything to say about that? Isn't there a kind of an, Im an implication there that Europe's not quite as good as uh, the Chinese or the Americans? <laughs> no, in his question, there seemed to be an implication there, don't you think? Well, um Maybe um, ju just one word on that. I mean, we also have uh, another program which is close in a way to, to what the IT does, which is uh, the Marie Sklodowska Curie action, uh, which uh, brings uh, a lot of talented people from across the world to uh, European um, research institutions and uh, has a strong connection with the business world. Uh, as well, so I think this this is uh, an important um, an, an, an important uh, action uh, in this regard. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe I should also mention uh, one uh, project which we are now uh, rolling out uh, and testing in the first place now, which is um, the uh, initiative uh, to uh, pool together universities, have European universities, which again is designed to strengthen Europe's uh, capacity when it comes to uh, academic excellence and uh, this project is something uh, that will be further strengthened and embedded in the, the next generation of programs. So the Erasmus program itself has an, an extremely important role to play when it comes to, to making uh, Europe a, a very attractive place when it comes to academia, when it comes to, to innovation and research. As there well. was an impl implication though that we need to import talent rather than nurture and create talent. I'm a little bit uh, counter-argument that, yeah? Because, yes, it's nice and all over the world there might be super international talents, but you have to be careful You, if you attract them, you gi have to give them also uh, this super attractive workplace and environment. Yeah, And I'm hesitating if all the, the majority of companies can afford that. Uh, there might be international active companies, yes, of course, but um, so I'm representing a European industry. Yeah? We are all over Europe and uh, a lot of my peers are European based and European limited. And I think, I, I, I think we have these talents here in the regions uh, and uh, they have to be attractive, discovered, uh, supported, motivated because as I'm as a representative of a major company based here in Budapest and in the CE countries, I see it as my responsibility to carry this economy forward. Yeah, uh, so that to, to give something back also to the uh, community which is existing here in these countries. And if I have the privileged chance to move between Europe, yeah, the countries then, I have to motivate young talents out of these countries yeah, to, to bring their home states for, forward. I don't see, of course, there is a brain drop, but we as the economy, together with such institutes, yeah, which has Europe in its name, we have to counter, to counter work that this brain drop don't uh, continue. Uh, that, that, that I'm a little bit... Uh, yeah, very emotional on that because that is so near to my heart and uh, I do on top of my uh, professional work, operative work, support these activities that much because I'm deeply convinced that uh, in this there is the great chance for a united Europe. Thank you for that. I, I, I personally don't believe it's a choice between nurturing local talent and attracting foreign talent. Uh, it should be about mobility and we should be passport agnostic um, and, and just generally nurture and try to, 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 to attract talent. Um, and the, the, the future generations care more than current generations about the value that they bring with their work. So this is exactly suited to, to the type of innovations that EIT is supporting, which is resolving societal challenges. They want to work for a company that is contributing in a certain way to the society. And that is more important to them, really, and not just in theory. It is more important to them than, uh, than, than the actual salary that they get. The salary is also important, but it's secondary. You're saying uh, that's a generational difference? It's right? a generational difference. And it is also about how you work together, what is the structure of involving them in the decision making. It's also about you know, letting them bring their dog on Fridays and being more flexible or working from home. There is all of that and it, this is now a global phenomenon that, that we're now adapting to. And all the companies are fighting for talent and, and, and retaining talent. Uh, and then uh, there are some, some times when you have to let them go because it's natural. 
this is, this is, and, and they like to be mobile and change. It's part of that as well. So, so the idea is to retain them for as long as they are really bringing value and to keep them being happy and work with them and look at their, and, and this is a challenge now for all managers. Um, the brain drain is still apparent more in, 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 in the less developed part of Europe for sure, uh, but the mobility also comes another way. So I know that the Minister of Montenegro, just like in Serbia, you have benefit from, from a lot of people have emigrated, let's say, to the universities in Western Europe or, or, or our keynote today who will tell us about the creative industries who then comes back and is able to share that knowledge uh, involve someone in a big horizon project from that lab or involve someone in a knowledge community connecting Europe. And, and that's, that's the whole idea is that you use, you really take advantage of the new technology to, to bring back talent in a different way, to use it in a different way. So this is a, a global challenge. And um, I know there is a big debate going on about this uh, quality of life uh, commissioner in Europe, but the World Bank in a few years ago did a report about uh, economic development in Europe, which has, it has not done for a long time because it focuses on developing countries, it focuses on poverty reduction. Uh, but it, in that report, uh, uh, it concluded that it's one of the benefits and one of the contributors to economic development in Europe is this work-life balance and put, taking that in and being more productive at the workplace. So it is something we should cherish as Europe and not to try to, to get away with, go, go away Emma, with. Emma, you had something to say? Just a small reflection on the, can you hear me? Okay, no, great. So small reflection on the same topic. Uh, I fully agree with Anna. Uh, and, and what we see is that the, the local students, they, they get to be a part of something that is bigger. So we bring in a lot of experts, yes, from, from Palo Alto, from, from Japan, from South Korea. And, and this is bringing the value to, uh, the, the, to the local universities, to the regional universities, but also the, the uh, tra industry tradition that we have here in Europe. It's a very nice and very strong and very solid industry tradition, good engineers. And when they can also use that, uh, to, to create something with, with a disruptive technology culture coming in, then it's a synergy that can be actually one of the best things we've seen so far in the, in the development of the European industrial history. So I think that it, it should, we should not consider that one or the other. It's, it's a fusion that creates some really super excellent interfaces. There's a question down here. Hi. Uh, my name is Alexandros Haralambidis. I'm Can you just speak up a little bit, please? Yes. Hi, my name is Alexandros Haralambidis, or Alex for short. I'm from the Cyprus University of Technology. And I have a problem that I don't know if you can help me. Maybe Anna from your um, saying before about the message we should use. Um, the problem with Cyprus is that we have low index on innovation. We spend very little of our GDP. However, I cannot use statistics, for example, will expand our economy. If I use Israel as an example, where 8% of its economy relies on innovation, that took 50 years. So I cannot use that message. If I say universities will become autonomous or we have income from innovation, I cannot use that either because in the best case, three, four percent of a university can rely, its income can rely on innovation. So what kind of messages can I use to convince my government to fund more innovation? What kind of KPIs can I use? What messages? That's Thank a good you. question. Who wants to go on that one? I, th I think he did ask you, yes. <laughs> I think you asked me, but I think my colleague from Montenegro can help you probably more. I think one way is to, to select a minister from, from the scientist pool <laughs> 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 who is already convinced. Uh, that, that's the easy way. And that the discussion we had earlier is that uh, you can do the most from the government perspective still, if you want to have a wider policy impact. And until then, you know, we can rely only on the fact that this is interesting uh, to people overall, to voters, and make it, uh, make it a topic over time. Um, and, um, you know, education is generally a topic, but it tends to be a social topic, and we need to change it from being a social topic to a business topic. How does this make us uh, have a better 
uh, income and a better uh, livelihood. Uh, uh, it, it is a challenge, and I think the easiest way is to do what Montenegro did and just import a scientist into the government. So the argument is to, is to t tell the, your minister that he should talk to the education minister a bit more often. Actually, that's a struggle I have always had, is that the education ministers are always seen as the social service ministers and not as the most important ministers of today, ministers of the future. Uh, th this needs to shift. Uh, they, they need to have a, a completely different perception, uh, starting with the politicians and starting with the person they select for that role. I mean, that should be the, the, the role that one should fight for. Currently, it still is, and we have a leading uh, political scientist here, distinguished Professor Weidewey. I think he will, Weidefeld, who will confirm that still the most important positions are Minister of Interior uh, and Minister of Justice. Whereas, in my opinion, this really needs to be the Minister of Education. You have a minister to your left. I'm sure she has something to say. I'll just make one comment. Maybe it will not help you so much. But Br uh, bring up the microphone a little nearer. Sorry. Okay. So, I, as I said, I was coming from paradise, from CERN, uh, with 120 nations, and uh, there is only a flight of two hours, and then, then you come to the part of Europe, so-called Western Balkan Europe, and then you feel an enormous gap from this part of Europe to the, uh, compared to the rest. But then, in this year, my first year of, of minister, it was really hard, in, that was 2017. But then what happened is, uh, actually, thanks to our participation in, in EU program, what happened is that uh, we were able to absorb uh, uh, funds from the Horizon 2020, and we had a net gain. For the first time, we had really a net gain. And you know what happened? Uh, it, this uh, prime minister um, uh, gave me a gift for the next year. He increased my budget by 60%. So don't ask about absolute level, but uh, this is exactly what you need to do. You really need to show the value, uh, and uh, and then it really helps. Even how on did you get level. involved in the project in the first place? Did you actually literally know the people involved? And uh, sorry, how did you get involved in that project in the uh, first place? Yes, what happened is actually um, in the past we started. We uh, we were associate uh, uh, country to Horizon 2020 since 2014, and our success rate was very very low. So what really happened is that we. Uh, appointed the national contact person. We, find, we found the right per, uh, people, and then all of a sudden, uh, this uh, success rate increased, and that was a really strange year of 2017 for Montenegro, because we moved from the last place to the first place. This success rate is, okay, can be fluctuation, but it was not fluctuation, it was, it was uh, a net gain. But also, I, I need to stress um, uh, really the challenge in this part of Europe, because we cannot use structural funds, and also our um, economy is uh, rather weak. But then, as I said, if you put forces on the right people, again, on the right people, you really make uh, a difference. And, of course, we were connected to the rest of Europe because this, this really connection and what you are using, you are doing, like EIT, EIT this network of uh, institute, is really a great, great benefits also for us. But bef beside connecting these networks, what probably is absolutely important for getting funds uh, when I would be in a university in Cyprus, um, so I know Cyprus a little bit, it's a wonderful island, but without uh, bigger industries. Yeah? But nevertheless, you have students there, what I observe from uh, the African continent, from the Near East, so from other areas where they have total different problems to be solved than maybe in Europe. And I was would focus on successful showcases, so I mean when you have got the funds, immediately one or two or three showcases where uh, a problem from the island is solved uh, and a use case, produce a use case where really you can see that there is a usage for that. Maybe it's in because I know there are water shortages, so I mean maybe these are a technical innovation, how you can better utilize the resources, or in tourism, the tourism is still uh, on a lower level, how you can utilize digitalization in this uh, tourism area, so some practical issues what convince the local decision makers that this university work has value. Which is effectively what you were saying as well, the same kind of thing where you've got to be able to show that you've worked uh, and then you might get the budget boost. We only have uh, three, three minutes or so left. Um, we have another question? Oh, yes, we do. 
Great, well, let's try and go for a quick one then. Hi, uh, my name is Elias Almanor. I'm from Israel, almost Europe, almost Europe, yes. Um, and I'm part of the jury. And um, I, it was a lot of discussion here uh, regarding the connection between innovation and economy. And one thing that was not mentioned is the role that is being, that has to be played by the multinational companies and the large companies in Europe, and there are many like that. And these uh, players, which are uh, m major players in this ecosystem that you are trying to build here, they are in need, in urgent need of open innovation, then urgent need of uh, entrepreneurship. So this is your market, these are your customers. What, so what's I the question? We're hang on, we've got two and a half I, I think left. that oh. they have to be included in this so ecosystem. How do you include the multinationals? I'm here. There we go, we've got one here. Otherwise. But uh, <laughs> I, did not, I did not hear about the role that they are playing here, the multinational companies, because they have to play a role. They are the customers. What do we have innovation. to do to bring them on board? Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, as I said, as part of Energy, what will be in the future part of E.ON, we have a lot of projects here, what is maybe Horizon 1 and Horizon 2 innovation, which is even on the list of our central um, uh, innovation uh, projects. Yeah? So we need, you are absolutely right, we need uh, these innovators from the country, so therefore I'm so much arguing for the local talents and we need to develop something for our local customers. Yeah, we have to digitalize our customer service for the benefit of the whole um, inhabitants of Hungary. We have, to, we have to digitalize our grid for the security of supply and we are trying to do that. Th that is what I mean, um, and I try to convince my peers from the other, from the other multinational companies. Is it the CEO of Siemens? Is it the CEO of BISF? They are all involved in this work, in this network. What I'm saying, they I'm offering, uh, I'm offering really a partnership with the LIT, uh, yeah, to to become more integrated. So. I, I agree with you, there is the responsibility of the multinational companies. Emma, go on. Uh, yeah, we, just to mention, we did an instrument with, um, with a startup of Northvolt, where we uh, uh, had a partnership program for some selected industrial players, uh, multi-size companies, that were invited not because they had only funds, but uh, in the same way as EIT you know, Energy was a great sort of business partner, advisor and so forth, we brought them on because they were potential customers, uh, OEMs, co-workers and also vendors, so, so suppliers to us. So, so creating a, a sort of ecosystem around the all the disruptive and innovative companies was a really sort of winning game for us. Was it easy uh, to persuade them to join together with you? Were they skeptical? Uh, depends on what you mean with easy. I mean it was, it, it was not a, a sort of, it was not it, it was some funds that they had to come in with and also some efforts. So I think... And how, what was the lead time? How long did it take? Different, but I think very short considering the efforts and the investment that they had to, to, mm. to come with. And uh, a very strong commitment from their side. I think we've run out of time. It's just gone to zero down here. So thank you, everybody. It's been a fascinating panel. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> it is now half past two. And um, so please make sure that you voted and uh, that you have uh, given your choice in the public award. You can do that on innovate.eu. You can do it on the application. Uh, we have got coming up uh, a keynote uh, speech from uh, Michaela Magash. We have a unique uh, cultural interlude and debate as well. And of course, we have the uh, band as well tonight. So make sure you s stick, stick around for that because it's going to be very cool. But right now, it's coffee time. We've got 25 minutes to go and network. Maybe ask some of the questions you didn't get to ask to, to these people. And uh, I'd like you all to come back, please, uh, by around uh, 14.55, around about 25 minutes from now. Thank you. <laughs>